Okay, hello everyone. This is the Circuit Python Weekly meeting for Monday, August 22nd, 2022. So 822-2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things Circuit Python. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on Circuit Python. Circuit Python is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. We host this meeting on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you would like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPython used as Discord role. As I mentioned, there's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. The notes doc is uh, posted in, it's a few posts up in the CircuitPython dev channel right now, and you can also find it in the pinned messages in the CircuitPython dev channel. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes, so it gives, gives you the option to skip around. After each meeting, we'll post a link for the next meeting's notes documents, the CircuitPython dev channel and the Adafruit Discord, and pin that to the channel. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, feel free to leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read out loud during the meeting. The meeting is held in five parts. The first part is community news, where we look at thing, all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is hug reports, which is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, you can take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to over the next week until the next meeting. And finally, the fifth part is in the weeds, which is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of something you reported in the status updates or be something you've identified ahead of time as too long to discuss in status updates. So with that, I'll do uh, community news right now. And let me put it in a timestamp, scroll up to here, and press the button. There we go. OK. So these, these news items are from the upcoming CircuitPython uh, or Python and Microcontrollers newsletter that's coming out tomorrow. Thank you, Anne. OK. First thing is that CircuitPython 8.0.0 Beta 0 has been released. Uh, it, it is a relatively stable release, but there will be further additions and fixes before final release. Usually we wait when we get do a beta to say that the APIs are not going to change and the feature list hasn't changed. There'll probably be a few changes, but not very many before final release because we've got a while before final release, but we want to make it clear that it's sort of past the alpha stage right now. There's a whole bunch of interesting things in the beta release. The last alpha, the, the previous uh, 800 release was the alpha release and it was over two months ago. So since then, things have come in like um, the Wi Fi workflow is really quite functional now. There's a status bar that shows up on your terminal window or on the display, onboard display on the CircuitPython board. And there are a bunch of other things. So look at the release notes. There's a link in the notes doc to those. Um, Okay, next item, timestamp. Uh, CircuitPython Day was a success, great success. That was last Friday. Um, it was 
uh, August 19th. In typical fashion, it did not disappoint with many of video streams with the community and folks showing their projects. Thanks to all who participated. There's a playlist on the Adafruit YouTube site um, of, of all the streams that we sponsored. Um, there's a link to that playlist in the notes. Uh, there was a CircuitPython Day introduction, and then there was a panel discussion run by Paul Cutler with a number of us. Then there was a development sprint, um, video intro. Uh, Maker Melissa did a project build on video. There was a longer form show and tell, which was great. Um, Scott did a Circuit Python 8 preview of the upcoming features, including Wi-Fi workflow and the status bar that I mentioned. Then uh, Katni, Jeff, and I had a chat about projects that we're working on and interesting things that we're, we've been working on. And finally, um, Foamy Guy did a CircuitPython Day game jam stream, which is hard to say fast, 10 times. And also the Blues Wireless Company uh, did a YouTube on reimagining IoT deployments with CircuitPython. So check out all those links which you can find in the notes doc. Okay. Next thing of note is that um, yeah, recently, not in beta zero, it's been, I think it was after that, I believe, I'm not sure. Uh, CircuitPython added RP2040 I2C target support. It used to be called I2C peripheral, but basically it can act as an I2C device rather than a controller of an I2C device. So that means it's useful for communicating uh, between, say, two RP20s, 2040s. One is would be the controller and the other would be the target. Um, and there's a link to the pull request for that. Um, next up, um, in regular Python news, Python 3.11.0 RC1 is now available. That's the first release candidate of Python 3.11. Uh, it's the penultimate release review Entering the release candidate phase, where only reviewed code changes, which are clear bug fixes, are allowed. Um, second candidate and the last planned pre lease preview is currently planned for Monday, September 5th, while the official release is planned for Monday, October 3rd. So 3.11, it doesn't seem that long ago that 3.10 came out, uh, so this is very interesting. Uh, from my point of view, one of the most interesting things in Python 3.11 is that it has supports something called task groups in async IO, which makes using async IO a lot easier. And we hope to put task groups into CircuitPython uh, uh, eventually. Uh, MicroPython is also looking for that, and we'd probably just take their implementation. Another really interesting thing about Python 3.11 is that the performance has been improved a lot uh, in various ways. And so it's worth checking out for that reason. So where did this, all this news come from? It came from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, which is run every, which is emailed every Tuesday. The archives are at a link available in the notes doc. Uh, the newsletter highlights the latest Python or hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. We love to have your contributions to the weekly newsletter. You can contribute by emailing cpnews at adafruit.com. You can uh, tag a tweet on Twitter with circ uh, hash mark, hashtag CircuitPython, or you can submit a pull request to the newsletter, and the link to that, to the GitHub repo for that, is in the notes doc. So feel free to contribute. We really love to have news and pictures and all kinds of stuff. The more, the merrier. OK, so now we'll move on to. Uh, the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Um, overall, in the past week, there were 33 pull requests merged, 23 authors. Some new ones that I haven't seen before, new authors are Socratisvas, O. Kennedy, uh, Colin WQ, um, R. Balson 1, uh, maybe VM0824, Vladek. Probably, probably some of these people have contributed before, G. Belland. Thank you very much. There were nine reviewers of these 33 pull requests. And overall, in the whole project, there were 24 closed issues by 14 people and 23 opened by 16 people. So as usual, the number of open issues and closed issues tends to stay 
about the same. Okay, uh, so um, next up is core. Since I'm running the meeting, uh, Jeff, would you like to read about the core? Is that okay? Hello, sure. Uh, let me just get back to the correct part of the document. So in the core, we had 17 pull requests from merged from 12 authors. Um, May R. Homar is a name I don't recognize. Uh, so thank you to you and any other people who are new or infrequent contributors to CircuitPython. And thanks also to our five reviewers. Um, reviewers are what makes the world go round and lets us merge in high quality changes to CircuitPython. And Katni will talk more about what reviewers do when uh, she talks about the libraries. Anyway, in terms of pull requests, we've got 16 open pull requests some of them up to 194 days old, and the newest is three days old. I know some of those older ones are in uh, draft condition or waiting for uh, response to a review request. So if that, replies to, if that applies to one of your PRs, please um, let us know when you are able to work on that, uh, push some new work, or um, yeah, if it won't work out, then please just feel free to say that as well. Sometimes it doesn't but our goal is to help get your pull requests merged. So also ping us if you're waiting for uh, action from somebody kind of on the, the Adafruit core developer side. Issues wise, we had 12 closed issues by seven people and nine open by seven people. So we are net down a couple of issues. That's always nice to see. That leaves us 551 open issues. However, we usually categorize things by milestones and the important milestone that we're looking at right now is 800, which has 34 open issues. We are probably going to look at that list soon and move some of them to an 80x list. Those are issues that wouldn't stop 800 from being released, but we still think are important to address as uh, bug fixes, uh, fixing regressions, or hardware support for some of these new microcontrollers that we're adding in 80. Uh, also, there are 491 long-term issues, and that means that Adafruit doesn't prioritize working on them, but we are more than happy to see you pick up and work on any of them that are of interest to you. And Discord is a great place to ask questions about how to get started uh, working on one of those issues. And um, as Dan already touched on, we released the beta, the first beta for version 8, and that is kind of continuing towards completion, and we just need to chip away at those 34 open issues, either by resolving them or by deciding that we can move them to a later milestone. And that's what's going on in the core. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Okay, next up is libraries. And Katni can tell us about all about the libraries. Thanks, Dan. This section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. We had 15 pull requests merged by 11 authors, a number of those names I don't recognize, uh, most of them Dan called out earlier, and seven reviewers. Um, we merged a few pull requests that were uh, a month old and uh, one that was just under two weeks old, so I'm really glad to see that we're still getting to uh, older issues. And we currently have 31 open pull requests. Um, which that number is up, but I believe we had a number of folks uh, submitting PRs last week, so that's not surprising. We had nine closed issues by five people and 10 open by six people, leaving us with 669 open issues. 173 of those are good first issues. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all this information and more, including open pull requests, uh, which if you're interested in reviewing, that's a great place to start. Take a look at the code. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, leave a comment that you looked at it. Um, let us know what you saw. Is there an issue? Um, if there's not, let us know that. All of that is very helpful. And once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about uh, leveling you up to the review team. And if you're interested in contributing documentation or code, Check out the list of open issues. They're divided up by repository, and you can search by label. And if you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. Um, we have a 
guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help you out. So don't let the process intimidate you. We want to make sure that you can help out in a way that works for you. Uh, there's also bug or enhancement um, in terms of uh, more difficult issues uh, to fix up. And so depending on your level, we should have something that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had no new libraries, but a number of updated libraries that I will not read off. The list is in the notes if you're interested. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you very much, Katni. Okay, next up is Blinka, and uh, maker Melissa will talk about it. Hello. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And uh, this week we had one pull request merged by one author and uh, myself as the reviewer. And we have currently four open pull requests still. There were three closed issues by three people and four open by three people, leaving a net of 81 open issues. There were 11,608 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are currently at 89 supported boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Okay, next up is Hug Reports, which is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start as meeting host, then we'll go down the list alphabetically. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, but that you have a Hug Report, I'll just read it off as I get to it. So feel free to contribute to this, even if you can't attend to the meeting or you can't speak during the meeting. Okay, so I'll give a timestamp for myself. Um, first of all, thanks, Katni, to organize, for organizing CircuitPython Day last week. It was fantastic and ran really smoothly and had just jam-packed. I think it was like our most uh, eventful one in terms of event, you know, number of events, uh, which was great. Uh, thanks to Paul Cutler for running the panel that uh, several of, of, of us were on. Um, and interviewing us. Um, we had some pre discussions before that and it worked out really well. Um, thanks to uh, Katni and Jeff for joining me on the stream chat that we had. And especially Katni gave a detailed overview of a mailbox monitoring project. And this is a mailbox, a physical mailbox, a US mailbox. Uh, and we're, um, it was a very interesting project and it was a really practical project. And it's interesting how many pieces there are to such a, that kind of a project. Uh, thanks to all the people who streamed on CircuitPython Day and everyone who attended the live streams or watched the streams later. Thanks to, now leaving CircuitPython, uh, thanks. Thanks to Scott for fixing a ton of issues just before his parental leave, which starts today. He'll be gone for about 12 weeks. Um, and so we've got to uh, put, take up the slack in his stead, but he fixed a whole bunch of things and left us in a really good place for an 8.0 release. Thanks to Dave Putz, who uh, quickly diagnosed and fixed a rotary I.O. issue that somebody posted just a few days ago. Thanks to maker Melissa for adding at light speed all the new boards that were added in the 8.0 beta zero release. That was fantastic, and it makes keep CircuitPython.org up to date. So maker Melissa says, she added some new boards, but there are a lot of boards. Uh, I think there were like 15 boards or something. So thank you for continuing to work on that. And uh, in my own life, it's just I started um, being paid to work on CircuitPython five years ago this month uh, by Adafruit. Uh, thank you so much, Adafruit, for contracting with me for five years. It's very fantastically fun. It's a really gratifying work. It's like kind of the best job I've ever had. And it's a huge pleasure to work with and get feedback from the community. That's one of the most gratifying things about it. Okay, next up is um, uh, Blitz City DIY Liz, who isn't at the meeting, so I'll read her notes. Thanks to Katni for organizing Circuit Python Day. A group hug to everyone who came on Circuit the Circuit Python Day show and tell. And thanks to Melissa for leading, lead hosting the regular show and tell for the first time last week and hosting her own solo live stream on Circuit Python Day. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, next up is C. Grover. And I'll read 
their contribution as well. Thanks to the team for organizing and conducting CircuitPython Day. The special show and tell was amazing as well. Thanks to John Park for adding practical build content with wonderful photos to a recent learning guide project. Hugs to Anne B for assisting with the guides publishing logistics. Thanks to Foamy Guy for educational and inspirational live coding streams. Not only does Foamy Guy introduce and explain Python programming solutions, the high level thought process and structure examples are greatly influencing my design decisions and approach. And thanks to Dan H on his Adafruit anniversary you are a beloved cornerstone of this community. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, next up is David Clouda, who also is not speaking, but is in the meeting. Uh, thanks to Dan H for the release of 800 Beta 0. Thanks to Jeff and Scott for sharing on the tiny USB versus CircuitPython and board with or without UF2 bootloader. I guess that for sharing an explanation. Um, thanks to Neurodoc for explaining creator ID versus USB vid and PID for ES32 boards. Thanks to John Park for an oddly specific stream on LCDs. That's a new product that Adafruit is stocking. Oddly specific is the maker of that, and they're very interesting uh, LCD boards. Um, thanks to Todd Gott for suggesting ES Play. Micro V2 as an alternative to the impossible to find Odroid Go. And thanks to all the architects, organizers, and participants of or to the CP CircuitPython Day. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, echoing uh, what a few folks have mentioned, uh, hug report for Catney for planning and organizing CircuitPython Day. Uh, definitely had a great day and um, echo uh, again what Dan said, it, it went really smoothly. And so really appreciate all the work that went into it. Um, everyone who participated in or watched along with any of the streams on CircuitPython Day, there was lots of great content and uh, lots of great folks popping up in the chat and uh, even just watching along. So thank you to everybody who did. Um, thank you to uh, GitHub user TC Franks, who has been submitting a bunch of PRs lately, uh, lots of typing uh, information and other improvements to libraries. So um, thank you to them. Uh, a report for uh, TechTrick for doing the introduction video and working on uh, sprints on CircuitPython Day, as uh, well as the rest of the folks who uh, participated that I didn't list. Definitely appreciate everyone who helped out in the chat and anybody who uh, did make a contribution. Um, thank you to, uh, uh, let's see, Bab Lock B uh, for submitting some improvements to the Sparkline graph inside the Display Shapes library. Um, thank you to uh, Retired Wizard uh, for jumping in and helping on the hack tablet, uh, helping troubleshoot some of the issues we're seeing there. Uh, and then a group hug for uh, anybody who I missed, because I'm sure I have uh, missed somebody with all the great stuff going on lately. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Foamy Guy. Okay, next up is Jeff. All right, hello again. I want to thank Katni for organizing a marvelous day, by which, of course, I mean CircuitPython Day, and Paul Cutler for hosting our panel session. And uh, Paul put a lot of thought into that beforehand, and I think it really showed in how things flowed and, and how it worked. Uh, and I want to thank everybody else who participated in CircuitPython Day in one way or another. Um, there were a lot of people you know, doing the streams. There were a lot of thoughtful questions and discussion in the Discord chat, and it was a lot of fun to see all that go by. And just to uh, cheat a little bit, I want to thank everybody that Katni is about to thank as well. Okay, thank you, Jeff, by forward reference. Okay, okay, next up is Katni. All right, so overall, thank you to everyone who participated in CircuitPython Day 2022. Uh, more specifically, <clears throat> thanks to Liz for hosting a special edition show and tell. I watched along the whole time and it was excellent. Um, to uh, hug, hug for Melissa for her first ever live stream. It went amazingly well. There were multiple comments about, was this really your first live stream? I don't believe it. <clears throat> so good job there. To Paul Cutler for introducing the whole day. Um, when the panel discussion that was also hosted by Paul uh, ended up being the first event, um, I thought 
why don't I have Paul also introduce CircuitPython Day overall? Um, so I asked him to do that and uh, freaked him out a little bit, but he offered, um, when I offered to brainstorm through it with him, he was like, all right, yeah, let's do this. Um, so thank you for doing that. It was one less thing on my plate and um, it's kind of uh, like perfect for a community member to be introducing CircuitPython Day since that's kind of what the whole thing is wrapped around. Um, and also Paul for hosting a panel discussion. To Jeff, Dan, and Tim for participating in the panel discussion with me. Um, outside of CircuitPython Day, to Dan for five years at Adafruit. Back to CircuitPython Day. Uh, Scott for the CircuitPython 8 preview and demos. To Jeff and Dan for joining me for a wonderful CircuitPython Day chat. To Tim for hosting the Game Jam stream. To Tectric for coordinating and hosting the CircuitPython Day development sprint. Uh, group hug to the folks who volunteered to help out with the development sprint, and group hug to those who contributed during the development sprint. To Anne for keeping up with the socials, blogging the events, and getting all of the day's videos into one playlist on YouTube. To Phil for support while I was planning CircuitPython Day. To Mr. Certainly for moderating multiple chat streams throughout the day and aggregating questions from YouTube and Twitch into Discord so that uh, the streamers could monitor a single chat while live streaming versus needing to keep track of everything. Um, to Mark Gambler for providing two as seen on show and tell feather badges to give away. To Kmatch for providing the hack tablets to give away around uh, Foamy Guy's game jam stream. To Adafruit's graphics creator Bruce for the CircuitPython Day 2022 graphic and creating a separate graphic for my chat with Jeff and Dan. Um, in terms of a uh, project I did, uh, thanks to Carter for sending me two Pi Zero Ws a while back. Um, making the mailbox demo that I did on the chat stream possible. To Rose for helping me get the right demo code going on the mailbox demo at almost the last minute. Uh, and to Jeff for helping me explain the parts of my demo that I didn't quite entirely understand. Um, there's parts of the code that are a little outside my wheelhouse and uh, that was greatly appreciated. A group hug to the community for watching the CircuitPython Day live streams and making CircuitPython what it is. And apologies to anyone that I may have missed. Thank you all. All right, thank you, Katni, for that comprehensive overview. That was great. Uh, next up is Kmatch, who isn't here, so I'll leave their contribution. Uh, thanks to everyone who made a great CircuitPython day, and thanks to Mike Maybe and Jerry Dudell for the ultrasonic sensor library, which is the HCSR04, including a few key comments. Okay, next up is Melissa. Hello. Um, I wanted to first give a hug to Katni for organizing CircuitPython Day. It went wonderfully. And again to Katni for encouraging, encouraging me to do a live stream on CircuitPython Day. It went better than I expected. A uh, hug to everybody who watched my live stream and gave me encouraging feedback. To Liz for co-hosting Show and Tell with me again, and also for her special CircuitPython Day Show and Tell. Uh, to Katni, Jepler, Foamy Guy, and Dan for the discussion panel. To Scott for the CircuitPython 8 preview stream. To Paul for your participation in CircuitPython Day and a bunch of different areas. And everyone who participated in CircuitPython Day, including those just watching that I hadn't mentioned. And to David Glada and Bill88T for adding boards to CircuitPython.org. And a group hug to anyone else. And okay. that's it. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, uh, next I have several text only entries. Uh, first up is Mark Gambler. Uh, thanks to Katni for organizing CircuitPython Day and everyone who participated. Thanks to Lee for continuing to work on his ADC buffer pull request and taking the time to learn about all the little gotchas for a core contribution. Yes, very much so. Thank you. Next up is Paul Cutler, who's text only. Thanks to Katni for all her work organizing CircuitPython Day. Thanks to Katni, Jeff, Dan, and Tim for being part of the panel discussion. And thanks to everyone who contributed to CircuitPython Day. Thanks to uh, Brent Rubel for being a guest on today's podcast episode and a group hug. And next up is Tammy Makes Things. Hi, everybody. So I have... Um... Hugs for Mark Gambler, Keith the EE, Deshipu, and Tech Trick for 
organizing slash participating in the CircuitPython Dev Sprint. Um, hugs for everyone who organized and participated in CircuitPython Day and a group hug. OK, thank you. Um, next is next is Tektrik, who's also text only. Uh, thanks to Katni for organizing all the logistics for CircuitPython Day. Thanks to Tammy Bakethings, Keith the E. Deshipu, Mark Gambler, and others who volunteered to help with the CircuitPython Day mini development sprint. Thanks to Dexter and other authors who, that contributed uh, PRs during said sprint. Thanks to everyone who held a panel, participated in a panel, shared a project, or otherwise chimed in during CircuitPython Day. Definitely a great day all around. Thanks to TC Franks for all the awesome type annotation PRs they're submitting. Thanks to a Lady Ada for being the guinea pig for the Pi Project that Tom will updates to the cookie cutter. And finally, a group hug. OK. So that concludes um, hug reports. And we'll move on to status updates right now. Status updates is a time to sync up on what we're doing. I'll start and go through the list alphabetically. As before, uh, you can take a couple of minutes to take, talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting or what we'll be doing in the next meeting. It does not necessarily have to have to do with CircuitPython, but it usually does. OK. All right, let's go ahead and I'll start first here. Uh, I released CircuitPython 800 Beta 0, which had over two months of changes, something like 146 pull requests, something like that. Uh, so there's quite a lot of stuff in there, including the Wi-Fi workflow, as I mentioned. And I'm continuing to fix issues for 800 final, which is a ways off, but uh, we're getting, we're making very good progress on that. Okay, next up is C. Grover, who's not attending today. Inspired by Foamy Guy's state machine coding approach, I spent the week refactoring an old but favorite Eurorack hysteresis-based quantizer module called Range Slicer. Also upgraded it from CircuitPython 5.3 to 7.3. Code is easier to read and module performance improved, was improved by 40%. When the module refactoring is completed, it'll be adjusted to power two new rack modules that use the same custom PCB board as Range Slicer. Hope to have ZY Comp and an HP test equipment inspired precision VCO working soon. And now, since we are seeing more than more 100 degrees Fahrenheit plus sun days, the extensive outdoor wind chime and wind sock collection is experiencing simultaneous UV-related materials failures. I'm restringing everything, substituting new materials, and applying UV protective coatings where possible. I'm assuming that the neighbors will appreciate hearing the late night windstorm concerts again. All right. Uh, next up is David Glauber. Uh, who's text only, so I'll read their contribution. Uh, CircuitPython.org improvement. S uh, some typo modification so that all boards of the same manufacturer match exactly. Thank you for that consistency check. And adding solder party BBQ20 KBD. That's from R2 or one ab 2 Suggesting improvement to learn guide. Um, how, to add in the, how to add a new board to the CircuitPython website. Force the aspect width and height when using egif.com. And uh, also talking about creator ID versus um, PID and VID for ESP32 boards. USB, PID, and VID. Um, OK. Reporting an old BLE bug when emulating mouse on two separate devices simultaneously. Testing I2C target on RP2040 and searching the box with all my ESP32 boards and failed to find something. I don't know <laughs> what. Okay, I know that feeling. Like, where is this thing? It's on the floor or something. I'm not sure. Okay, next up is Foamy Guy. All right. Uh, last week, um, did some uh, preparation and stuff around CircuitPython Day uh, for the panel, and then uh, my Game Jam stream on Friday. Um, I last week learned about building a debug build uh, of the core. Uh, I had never built a debug one before, as well as using the utility to, uh, I guess, decode or parse the, um, the uh, output of a um, stack trace. 
um, use that to work on some troubleshooting on the hat ta hack tablet. Um, I submitted uh, the kind of first draft version of a, a PR for uh, measuring the MPY file size from an actions task. I'm printing that information uh, in a comment. Um, and then uh, last week, uh, feels like forever ago, but just a week on uh, on Monday, I submitted the uh, Octopus Guide for final review. A um, couple things in mind this week. I am to look into if conditions uh, inside actions. I've used some very basic ones, but uh, I'm trying to figure out how to use them to basically limit when it will actually make a comment about the file size based on if it's um, a big enough margin over the current version uh, so that we don't necessarily print stuff out if it's not uh, really that big of a change at all. Um, I will also, uh, in relation to that effort for the, the size measurements, I need to move the script that actually does measure the size and compile it together for the comment over to a repo in CircuitPython.org. Uh, right now, that's just under my GitHub. Um, I, this week, want to try out uh, MPY tool, uh, which is a command line utility, and uh, figure out what all it does, what it can do. I'm not super familiar with it, and see if there's anything in there that could help us uh, on the memory me measurement front. Um, instead of doing stuff super manually with MPY files, it might be able to tell us useful information about them. Um, and then uh, last thing I have is uh, start publishing some walkthrough videos uh, showing how to set up a Minecraft server and all the plugins that you need if you want to create a uh, virtual feather synced uh, inside Minecraft with real one. This was a project I showed a little while back on Show and Tell in a few places, but it was kind of just in the proof of concept stage. Um, and I've gone back through it and tried to really uh, generalize it and make it so other people could um, hopefully repeat this on their end as well, instead of just my one specific hard-coded setup. Um, so I'm hoping to publish some of that information this week in videos. Thanks. OK, thank you. OK, next up is Jeff. Hi. So last week, I was on a little vacation in Colorado, which is the next state over. And on Friday, I made it back to participate in CircuitPython Day, about which much has already been said. Today, and there's an image in the notes doc that I will drop into Discord in a second, uh, I was helping move a four-ton CNC machine about 15 miles across town. Uh, this morning, we had it at the front of the garage where it had to leave from, and by this evening, it has to be in its new place. And just as an update, while I've been taking a break to come inside and go to this meeting, it's reached the new shop. Um, yay. It's safely down on the ground, but it will be a process to get it moving again just due to its complexity. It needs air compressor and three-phase power and things to be checked and, and all sorts of stuff, uh, but it'll be a little bit of a process. So for the rest of the week, I am going to uh, be working on updating the camera guide for CircuitPython to talk about the new module that's on the Espressif family microcontrollers. And then after that, I'm going to start on the PyCal Wi-Fi module support. Um, the first question is, to fit the firmware blob, how much do we have to give up in CircuitPython? Because I think the firmware is pretty full as it is, but we'll see. Um, and Lamore, helpfully, I, I should have given her a hug report, uh, helpfully walked me through, like, here's how to bring up the, the interface, generally bring up the interface between two devices that aren't using a standard protocol. Uh, so lots of helpful ideas for troubleshooting and problems that I might encounter. Uh, so I hope that soon, but soon might be two weeks, that I can get the LED that's attached to the Wi-Fi module to blink. And uh, David asked over in the comments on the Google Doc uh, where the firmware has to be. And um, I clarified that it does need to be on the, the RP2040's external flash chip because the firmware is uploaded every time. The uh, Wi-Fi chip does not have permanent storage for the firmware. So that's simply how it works. And that means that approximately 400K of that flash chip which is split between CircuitPython and the CircuitPy drive, uh, will just be taken up by that stuff. Um, and that probably means giving up something. But we don't know until we try, and that's what I'll be working on. Thank you. OK, thanks, Jeff. OK, uh, next up is Katni. Thanks, Dan. Last week, I fixed up two templates. The, I, uh, the I2S template uh, was using a discontinued 
um, I2S breakout. So that's been updated. Um, and the I squared C template was using outdated terminology. Um, so I got that updated. Um, I still have a blog post to update uh, for that. Um, I merged a few PRs, continued coordinating CircuitPython Day in the days leading up to it, and CircuitPython Day, which I will say, I put, I, I have a little paper cat attached to my microphone. And at the moment, I have a sparkly purple snake that nobody noticed. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, this week, I'll be finishing up the S3 TFT feather guide. Uh, then I will start working with ESP32 v2 Wi-Fi and Deep Sleep in preparation for a Wi-Fi version of my mailbox notifier project. Um, I'll be updating the CircuitPython ESP32 quick start guide to have a more thorough Thani section now that support for the, all of this has been released. Um, and then working on the mailbox notifier project guide. Uh, it may include LoRa as well as Wi-Fi, but at the moment uh, we are changing it up a little bit. Um, the plan is to find bugs with the ESP32 circuit Python setup and also use Thani as my ID to test it out with uh, the new circuit Python and ESP32 support. Um, then after that, I'll be updating the main guide for the quad alphanumeric backpack, which now has STEM QT and then a countdown project using three of the quad alphanumeric stem QT backpacks. Uh, and that is what's on my list. Okay, thank you, Katni. All right, next up is KMATS. I'll read their contribution. Tested the Adafruit ultrasonic sensor, the HCSR04 variant, to capture the distance to a rapidly passing sphere. In this case, it's a bowling ball. I think it's fast enough. Well, that sounds like a very interesting project. Okay, uh, next up, Maker Melissa. Hello. So last week I created a loader script so that the entire code.circuitpython.org website, uh, just the editor itself really, uh, will load from the device itself. And then I started adding some new boards to circuitpython.org. I finished up the code for the robot I built for my live stream. And then I also did lots of other like camera preparation, kind of doing a long run through for my Circuit Python Day live stream. Uh, I co-hosted show and tell again, but in the lead role this time. Uh, and then I live streamed on Circuit Python Day, and I started moving out of my offices over the weekend. Uh, this week, I'm going to finish adding the rest of the boards to circuitpython.org. And then I'll continue working on adding web workflow to code.circuitpython.org and finish up any features that are missing there. And if there's any time left, I might possibly start on a guide. And I'll probably be doing some more uh, moving and packing from my offices. And that's it. OK, thank you, Melissa. OK, next up is Tammy Make Things. Thanks. So last week, I participated in the CircuitPython Day Dev Sprint. And we had some fun collaboration and discussions. I added a comment to a pull request on the Adafruit CircuitPython debouncer library. Um, I wasn't able to actually test the code, but I had a couple of comments on how it was structured and working and stuff, so added those. And this week, I have no idea what I'm going to get done because work has been absolutely ridiculous, and I have 36 meetings this week. OK, thanks, Tabby. I hope it, it clears up. <laughs> Okay, next up is Tectric. I'll read their contribution. Uh, last week hosted the CircuitPython Day mini dev sprints along with a few others in the community. Started submitting bug fixes how, about how Adabot generates the infrastructure issues page on circuitpython.org. Added additional typing protocols to CircuitPython typing. Updated all the version strings that typically get replaced that's in the libraries to be compatible with PEP 440, so editable installs work again. Uh, fixed an issue with the NeoPixel library where chain dependencies weren't being recorded in the wheel that was built for PyPy, causing downloads via PIP to fail. OK. And then this week, continue working on patching and improving Adabot to handle recent updates to the libraries, catch up on a bunch of type annotation PRs, Implement a patch for allowing Sphinx to keep the copyright date up to date each time the documentation is built, 
and add additional cookie cutter updates. So thank you, TechTrick, for all this library infrastructure stuff, which makes libraries so much smoother. OK, and finally, in um, status reports, Anne says, I will be blogging about the NASA Artemis 1 moon rocket launch and behind the scenes as a social media selectee by NASA. Look on the Adafruit blog, Twitter, and my Twitter, at sign Anne, and underscore engineer, through into early next week. So check this out. You will see all kinds of Cape Canaveral rocket stuff. It's really interesting. Thank you, Anne. OK. So our last section is in the weeds, where we uh, do more long form discussions that come out of status updates or that people have identified ahead of time. If you have any in the weeds topics, please make sure they get added while we're discussing other things. Uh, so we're not waiting around to see if anyone has topics. So I will turn this over to Tammy Make Things, who uh, is, would like to talk about making CircuitPython dev sprints a regular activity. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I think we had a lot of fun on with the dev sprints. And um, one of the things that we were talking about in Discord was that that kind of dev sprint format is a good way to lower barriers of entry for newcomers who want to get involved with CircuitPython, but who want a little bit more interactive sort of guidance and support than just reading the Learn Guard guides and jumping into our very busy Discord. And so we were talking about whether it might be interesting and useful for the community if we had a monthly or quarterly like CircuitPython office hours or something that we had people who were a little more experienced who would volunteer to, to be there. And then people who wanted that support could come and get some support. And I think if we did it on a monthly or quarterly cadence, the, the, the um, frequency would be manageable enough that getting a couple of volunteers for each time shouldn't be super difficult. I know I certainly would volunteer, but um, I wanted to see what the rest of the community thought. So does anybody have any comments? I, I would say this sounds like a very interesting idea. And I think just the idea of office hours, even if not even something else so organized, is really good. If somebody knows that they can drop in at a certain point to be able to ask questions and get them answered is really uh, interesting, as opposed to just posting when you're in the middle of some problem and not being sure whether you're going to be able to move on at that point or not. Um, so I'm definitely a fan of this. Um, however, uh, my concern, which may have just been alleviated by Tectric, uh, my concern is the cycles needed to do it. Um, if the community is willing to support it, uh, I would definitely be all for it. If it's the expectation is that um, we as developers are also required um, and not just able to jump in when we're available. Um, that might be an issue uh, just because we we never know when we're going to have cycles um, in the future because sometimes we're, you know, running down bugs or, you know, trying to get a final version out, et cetera. Um, and that would mess up the cadence if we, you know, just couldn't do it at that time. So for me, the sprints are pretty confusing because I, I volunteered for them and I was present on all the channels, but I didn't really do anything else from what I normally do. So I'm not sure if that's what I was supposed to be doing or if I should have like uh, done something else. Uh, yeah. Maybe more actively look for, for people who who need help or or something? So I'm not even entirely sure what the, the what's what's happening during the sprints because for me it was yeah. uh, like regular helping on on this card. Shibu, you're always helping folks, and that was the point. It was just that was a time dedicated to helping folks. So you doing exactly what you normally do was absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. 
Yeah, I think the goal, at least of what I'm imagining, is that we would announce, you know, ahead of time and like at the time of whenever we're doing it, like, hey, everybody, I'm here for the next two hours if people have questions or need a little bit of extra support and like there's volu people volunteering to do that. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be scheduled ahead of time, although I think it's beneficial if people know, you know, the fourth Friday of every month from whatever time to whatever time, you can come to the Discord channel and there will be somebody there who is like sort of there just to help people. I agree with um, the I think, scheduling. I think it adds a little bit more... Um, I know like when I joined the community at first, it was a little bit overwhelming to try and just jump into the discord with everything that's always going on there. So some way of making it visible, you know, that there are people here who they are here for the purpose right now of helping you if you need help getting started, something like that. That reminds me, uh, there used to be, Brian Locke used to have, uh, uh, for, for just a few uh, streams, uh, used to have the streams called Project Doctor. Uh, he would basically sit in the stream and people would uh, uh, ask him questions about their own projects and he would give suggestions about what could be done to, to improve them. I'm not sure this is probably something completely different, but uh, I'm not sure if that could be useful somehow. Like have a project doctor. I know we have help with project or something like that, but it's not, uh, I don't know, just throwing it out there. <laughs> not really suggesting anything in particular. I think that's a good, that's an interesting idea too. This is sort of, that's sort of like office hours. So he's had, uh, and we know of some other discords that do this kind of thing. I think that, I think we could just try something on a casual basis and see how it evolves. I don't think we have to set hey. the format in stone or something. So I'd say like, if we set a time, see how it works. I think it might be interesting to have times that are not always at the same time, especially for people in other time zones. Like we might think of a morning sprint for people who are in Europe or further afield at some point and, and announce that in advance because use, often people are not on in the morning. And so people in Australia or somewhere else might say, I just, I never see those people on when I'm awake to be able to ask them questions. So, uh, we might consider also some more unusual timing on some, in some cases. Um, this meeting actually started as something totally different and evolved. So I, I agree entirely with, let's just give something a try and see how it goes. Um, and uh, yeah, move forward from there. So, um, we can make, Tammy, we could make a thread on the CircuitPython dev channel here for discussion. Mm -hmm. We can add all the folks who are interested in helping out. Um, and other folks can view it but um, and, and comment. Um, but we could at least make sure that we invite the everyone here who said, you know, I would love to help out with this, et cetera. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Perfect. Um, that's, I think, the route will go. And then we can you know, give it a try and see how it goes. Okay, that sounds, sounds good to me. All right, if anybody wants to add a, a couple of notes to the, in the weeds to the notes doc, that would be great just to summarize. Um, like that will have a thread or something. So that'll alert people who read the notes doc. Um, so I think I, I, if there's nothing, is there anything else? Otherwise I'll move on to a next topic, which I have is, which is quite short. I think. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead here. So uh, my question is, we have uh, a space problem on the matrix portal. It's an at SAMD 51J19, which doesn't have as much RAM as the other Pi portals, which tend to be 51 P20s. And so we found that projects on the matrix portal often run out of space when you import large libraries. So um, 
we've frozen some libraries, but then when we freeze libraries, we don't have enough room for all the usual firmware. So uh, uh, we've actually gone around, like at one point we removed BLE support uh, to make room for the libraries and then we added it back. Um, we've also talked recently about uh, removing ULAB because that's also large. Um, and both of these things have disadvantages. Um, and so uh, Carter and I, for instance, discussed like, well, which is, if we had to get rid of one of these things to make room, uh, which would it be? And I was just wondering if people have done matrix portal projects or other display projects that use up a lot of RAM, whether you feel like, oh, if I didn't have U ULAB, I'd be in trouble because I'm doing all kinds of calculations or, oh, I really want, if you, if you got rid of BLE, I wouldn't be able to update my um, Times Square news display from my phone or something like that. So does anybody have any opinions about either of those things, uh, about which, which you'd be the most reluctant to give up? Maybe you have no opinion. <laughs> so it's okay too. I, I think. We're, we're I think... Go ahead. I think we're leading toward. Uh, I think there's more. Carter thought of more projects that you might want to do with BLE than that. Than yeah. The ULAB. So, yeah, I was leaning towards keeping BLE as well because it seems like you can do, especially a lot more uh, basic things. I don't know that it necessarily holds true, but ULAB strikes me as a bit more advanced in the person who's interested in using it in a project um, may have an easier time being able to make a custom build um, and get themselves straightened out. Right. So Right. And there are the other things that they might then take out to make room or something. I mean, ultimately, we can also try to reduce the size of libraries, but that's pretty difficult. And um, we, won't, we won't gain. We need to gain a lot of space. So um, like the library that wasn't frozen. It, there was library that was frozen. We took it out and we want to put it back. And we put it back and it was like 16K of uh, MPY size or something. So we'd have to cut it way down to make any dent in that. So I, I think we'll move toward you uh, taking out ULAB in, for this particular case. Ultimately, uh, we've talked about uh, like how the matrix portal product itself might evolve. It doesn't, it's not stuck, you know, we have plenty of other chips that we can try to replace some of the stuff, you know, make a new kind of matrix portal. So maybe someday you'll see something like that. Who knows? All right, that's, that's it. So is there anything else before I wrap up? Um, if not, I'll tell you that this, uh, next week's meeting will be on Monday, August 29th, um, 2022. At the same time, 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific. Um, that's at the regular time. In two weeks, there's a U.S. holiday, so it'll be pushed uh, forward a day. But next week, it will be at its regular time. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And um, we'll wrap up the meeting for today. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll stop recording.